Thank you, colleagues. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 1755 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a timetable for the stage three consideration of the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. Um, could I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much, Minister. And no member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 17555 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. So we move on to that item of business, the stage three proceedings on the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. In dealing with this item, members should have with them the bill as amended at stage two, the marshalled list and the groupings of amendments. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. And the period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, there will be a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press their request seat button uh, as soon as possible after I call the group. So members should now refer to the marshalled list. And I call in group one on aims, I call amendment nine in the name of Colin Smith, grouped with amendments two, three, 10, 11 and 12, Colin Smith to move Amendment 9 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, amendment 9, in my name, which I move, amends the agency's aims so it's clear that they should be further in sustainable social and economic development rather than simply social and economic development. At stage 2, the bill was amended to call for sustainable economic growth, which was a, a welcome addition. However, my amendment makes clear that the principle of sustainability should inform decisions across the board when it comes to the implementation of the agency's aims, not only those expected to secure economic growth. For example, this includes environmental sustainability, supporting the sustainability of communities or the sustainability of vital but not necessarily profitable services if it furthers the aims of the agency. Sustainability should therefore be a key priority for the agency uh, and this amendment will ensure that the legislation reflects this. Amendment 2 in my name clarifies the importance of supporting rural businesses, enterprises and communities by adding reference to this in the agency's aims. It reflects the fact that, that, that large parts of the region are rural and these communities have specific challenges and opportunities as a result. That support can take several forms, for example, recognising the importance of rural-based industries such as forestry, aquaculture and agriculture to the region. And or it could recognise that creating a handful of jobs in a small rural community by supporting the many small and micro businesses could be as important to the sustainability of that community as, say, creating 100 jobs in a large town. The amendment makes clear that a one-size-fits-all approach will not work within the south of Scotland and ensures we learn from the current Scottish enterprise model, which has been the difficulty it has had properly responding to the unique needs of different parts of the area they cover. Ensuring that the agency delivers for our rural communities and recognises that will require a different approach is essential, and this amendment emphasises this by placing it on the face of the bill. Um, with regards to Amendment 3 from the Cabinet Secretary, it tidies up the language used in my amendment passed at stage 2, ensuring that supporting social enterprises and cooperatives was a key aim of the agency, so I'm, I'm more than happy to support Amendment 3. Amendment 10, in my name, adds the need to promote the development of affordable housing to the agency's aims. At stage 2, amendments relating to promoting digital connectivity and transport infrastructure were added to the agency's aims on the basis that these are key challenges in the region and the agency will have a role to play in helping tackle them. I believe the shortage of affordable housing is the other major issue of this kind and one in which there is a role to be played by the new agency. As with transport and digital connectivity, I'm not suggesting the agency should be seen as the only one to deliver on such an aim because quite clearly in relation to, for example, social housing, the main role will be played by the local authority and social housing landlords. Rather, this calls for the agency to promote the development of affordable housing to reflect the leadership role it should take in tackling problems in the area which are having an impact on, for example, economic growth. Just this week, I met with the largest social housing provider in the region who highlighted the skill shortage facing the area in various trades and the need for the new agency to work with them and the local colleges, for example, to support a Grow Your Own programme for tradespeople. So in fulfilling the aim, the role of the agency would be working with stakeholders, helping to develop solutions to the challenges the region faces with regards to affordable housing. But by making it an aim of the agency, it stresses the importance of this to the south of Scotland. 
Amendment 11 by Joe McAlpine adds reference to cultural heritage and the agency's aims, calling on the agency to maintain, protect and enhance cultural heritage. Now, you won't be surprised to know that having tabled the same amendment, I fully support this addition to the bill. The region has a rich cultural heritage and it is one of our key social and economic assets. I think it's right, therefore, that maintaining, protecting and enhancing our culture, as well as our natural heritage, is reflected in the agency's aims. And finally, Amendment 12 by Emma Harper clarifies the language in my own amendment from Stage 2 around the agency's responsibility to support the transition to net zero emissions. This is a crucial aim, so I'm more than happy to support the small but important amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 3 and the other amendments in this group. Mr Ewing. Uh, amendment 3 is a technical tidying up provision to ensure the Bill's terms are reflective of the full range of models that cooperatives and social enterprises come in. Uh, it's to deal with the technical defect uh, in uh, Mr Smith's amendment at stage 2, uh, which we welcomed. And I'm pleased to hear that he agrees that the form of Amendment 3 is acceptable. Turning to amendments from other members, I'm happy to support Amendment 9 lodged by Colin Smith. I agree the agency should be involved in furthering development in the region, which is both economically and socially sustainable. I'm also happy to support Joan McAlpin's Amendment 11 that emphasises the importance of protecting and enhancing the cultural as well as the natural heritage. And I thank Finlay Carson for highlighting this at stage two. And it builds on the good work of members of uh, the South of Scotland Economic Partnership, uh, such as Paula Ogilvie and Dame Barbara Kelly, in bringing experience of book festivals and art trusts to the South of Scotland. I will also be supporting Amendment 12. Emma Harper's amendment brings the bill's wording into line with climate legislation. So, I'm getting off to an extremely positive start, uh, presiding officer, which I hope is appreciated uh, by all. Um, however, however, <laughs> I, I do <laughs> have some concerns about Mr. Smith's amendments 2 and 10, but let me start off by saying that I absolutely understand the aims of what he's seeking to do, but I don't think that they're technically felicitous. I understand the point he's making with the reference to rural businesses, but I would contend that all businesses and, and communities in the south of Scotland are predominantly rural, including those based in some of the bigger towns like Dumfries and Gala Shields. If by rural, Mr Smith means those businesses which are considered to be rural industries like farming, forestry and fishing, it is absolutely the case that this agency will take a closer than ever interest in these vital industries to the south of Scotland. And I hope members will expect nothing less and they are right to do so. Uh, I appreciate the aim of Mr. Smith's Amendment 10 about affordable housing. Affordable housing is key to inclusive growth, as well as being key to achieving the aims of the proposed agency. Um, but I'm sure Mr. Smith would also not want to rule out supporting other types of housing than affordable housing and other types of housing, such as mid-market housing or indeed housing developments, not all of which may be affordable. Uh, and therefore, his amendment, and it's not intended to do this, may have the effect of, uh, of preventing him from so doing. I don't consider it's necessary for reference to the promotion of affordable housing to be set out in the bill because, presiding officer, this is already absolutely clearly implicit in the aims of the bill uh, as set out in the bill and the ways in which those aims will be supported. For example, I could refer members to section 5.2.F and section 5.2.B.A. We will, by, by having these provisions in the bill, already in the bill at stage two, already be supporting communities which incorporates affordable housing, of course it does, to help them meet their needs and to increase the number of residents who are of working age. Um, so I would encourage members to support amendments 9, 3, 11 and 12 and to resist amendment 2. Thank you. I call Joan McAlpine to speak to Amendment 11 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. My Amendment 11 emphasises the importance of protecting and enhancing the cultural as well as the natural heritage of the south of Scotland. During Stage 2 deliberations, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee was keen that cultural heritage was included on the face of the bill, recognising the role of culture alongside natural heritage. 
That resonates with people across the south of Scotland who are rightly proud of their culture, and that's why I would like to see Amendment 11 supported. The vibrancy of our area's culture is renowned locally, nationally and internationally. From the abbeys and the borders to the castles and standing stones of Dumfries and Galloway, the south has a heritage to be proud of. And that heritage spans centuries and many genres and forms. We're celebrating the 250th birthday of Walter Scott in 2021 and the 160th birthday of J.M. Barry next year. And I was very pleased to attend the opening of Moat Bray uh, Storytelling Centre in the house uh, that uh, J.M. Barry uh, found inspiration for Peter Pan in Dumfries. Uh, our summer in the south of Scotland starts with the Borders Book Festival and closes with the Wigton Book Festival. Kirkubri thrived as an artist town, uh, promoting Dorothy L. Sayers to, this, uh, to say in Galloway, one either fishes or paints. And of course, that historic success is built on with the wonderful new art gallery that opened in Kirkubri recently. Uh, right up to date, our success continues with the Dumfries-born Brit Award-winning DJ Calvin Harris. Uh, culture and the creative economy, as we know, is, is more than simply a means in itself, of course, and, and more than a means of boosting tourism, but it's a way of developing community capacity and aiding regeneration. And I would like to cite the work of the Stove Artists Collective in Dumfries in driving the Mid-Steeple Quarter, which is aimed at regenerating the high street through housing and other economic activity. And part of the Stove's uh, work also includes uh, Creative Futures, which is building community capacity in West Dumfries. And so that's a really good example of art and culture uh, playing an important role in engagement and energising communities and community development, which is very much, of course, in the spirit of what we're doing uh, with this bill. Uh, my amendment makes clear that one way that SOSE can further its aims is to maintain, protect and enhance the cultural heritage of South Scotland, and I urge members to support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Emma Harper to speak to Amendment 12 and the other amendments in this group. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I'm on my feet this afternoon to move Amendment 12 in my name. I welcome the amendments at Stage 2, firstly from the Scottish Government and then from Colin Smith, to commit the new South Scotland Enterprise Agency to work to support our climate change ambitions. While clearly Colin Smith's amendment helped move the framing of the provision into the appropriate space of net zero, I don't think the language was quite appropriate. My amendment therefore revises the language that, amendment, that the amendment was agreed to at stage two, whilst aiming to bring it in line with current terminology in environmental legislation, providing better alignment with the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009. Poseidon officer, this parliament is currently considering the climate change bill, which would set a world leading statutory target for net zero greenhouse gas emissions and is the flagship legislative response to the climate emergency. It's therefore appropriate that we link what we are trying to achieve in the environmental policy and legislation with the South Scotland Enterprise Bill. So I encourage members to support this amendment accordingly. I support also Amendment 11 by Joan McAlpine. It is absolutely essential that the new agency supports the wide-ranging cultural aspects which were highlighted very clearly by my colleague Joan McAlpine. And I agree with Cabinet Secretary regarding Amendment number 10. I would not wish this to lead to any duplication in uh, housing developments as local authorities and housing authorities and the Scottish Government has an absolute aim to build affordable housing. So duplication would not be my uh, goal. Yes. John Finney. Thank you. Um, I'm very grateful for the member taking an intervention on that point. Would the member not agree that social housing and, and the role that it plays, not only in retaining the population but encouraging the population, is worthy of specific mention? Because part of the aim of the, this legislation is to promote the South. Emma Harper. You had your chance. Thanks very much for, uh, for bringing that up, uh, John Finney. I think the Scottish Government already are committed to building affordable housing in rural communities. So that's an essential uh, programme that's already in place. I'm just not keen to have duplication because we already have concerns about multiple agencies, multiple members, not people not knowing the best direction to go. So affordable housing is essential, so, but I don't think it needs to be here at this point. 
So, thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Mate Rumbles. <clears throat> thank you, Presiding Officer. The Liberal Democrats will be supporting uh, Colin Smith's amendment number nine, Fergus Ewing's number three, John McCarpine and Colin Smith's number 11, and Emma Harper's amendment 12. Um, like the Cabinet Secretary, I, we have issues with amendments two and 10. Uh, we think amendment two is too restrictive. Supporting rural businesses. We all want to support rural businesses. Of course we do. But by putting that in the bill, what about urban businesses? So I do not think it meets actually what um, actually Colin Smith is aiming for. So I don't think that's right to put it on the face of the bill. And secondly, in his amendment number 10, promoting the development of affordable housing, we do feel very much that a mixed housing is necessary to support employment and bringing people into the south of Scotland. And I think if you just put, I think it's too restrictive, just affordable housing, as important as it is, of course. Oliver Mundell. I, I would just I thank the member for, for taking the intervention, but as, as someone representing uh, that part of the world, there, there is an acute problem uh, with affordable housing. And I've, I'm not convinced by the arguments the member's making or we've heard from other members that there's going to be any harm that comes from making that explicit in the bill. Can you explain? Mike Rumbles. Yeah, it's helpful intervention. Maybe I should explain more. I, I, I obviously, I believe actually it's quite a, really an important issue that everybody deserves to live in a decent house. That's a fundamental human right, and we're not meeting that need at the moment. But I have to say, uh, five two F supporting communities to help them meet their needs to me is an enabling uh, element here in this bill. And I just, I just think, well, I've just taken intervention on, on that point, but, but I will if, if you... Colin Smith. I mean, twice we've had um, members refer to other aims of the agency around communities, but frankly, those arguments could be used around the change we made at stage two on transport, for example, yeah. and also yeah. in digital connectivity, which in fact is a reserved issue. So could Mr. Rumbles explain why he supports transport and digital connectivity and promoting improvements there to be a, an appropriate aim for the new agency, but not housing, which is probably the third, along with transport and digital connectivity, a biggest issue facing the south of Scotland. Mike Rumbles. I do think Colin Smith is misunderstanding me. I actually just said, absolutely emphasised it, everybody needs a decent house to live in. It's a fundamental human right, and we need to focus on that. I'm worried about just putting on the face of the bill uh, the affordable issue. We have to have affordable housing, but if we are to attract employment to the, the south of Scotland, we need to encourage a mix of housing for everyone. And why I, I think the government are right in 52F, supporting communities to help them meet their needs, that would be the enabling legislation that I would prefer to support. And I have finished. Uh, thank you very much. In that case, there are no other members who wish to speak in this group. I call on Colin Smith to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 9. Uh, thank you, um, President Officer. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary and other support for some of the amendments, but I'm disappointed that when it comes to the substantive amendments relating to support and development of housing uh, and support in um, rural businesses, enterprises and communities, there isn't support there. I have to say that arguments against the housing amendment are exactly the same arguments that the government put at stage two, or rather stage one debate, against including transport and digital connectivity, which is a reserved issue and improving that as part of the aims of the agency uh, and why they do not believe that housing, which is probably the third other major issue facing the area, should be included um, is, 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 is disappointing, I have to say. I'll, I'll give way there. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Well, I'm most grateful for Mrs Smith giving way. I mean, the reason why we don't think the amendment should be accepted is that affordable housing already falls within uh, the definition of communities and the matters that are to be pursued. It's already something that the agency will do. And secondly, that by singling out one type of housing, as Mr. Rumbles indicated, that could, well, we're getting a lot of noises off, off, but by including one type of housing, which we all absolutely support in this chamber, the risk is that the interpretation of law by the courts uh, would be that other types of housing would not be something which the agency should be promoting. That is not something that any member surely would wish. Colin Smith. I don't think anybody is suggesting that the agency will take the lead on these areas in the same way they won't take the lead in transport. That's a role for Transport Scotland. Um, the point is the challenge we have in the region is around affordable housing. Housing is being built across Dumfries and Galloway 
and the Scottish borders, where the shortage is, where we need that intervention, where there is market failure, is around the issue of affordable housing. And that's one of the reasons why every day we see young people leaving the south of Scotland and moving into the central belt to get jobs and educational opportunities because they can't afford to have housing in the south of Scotland and the job opportunities are not there for them. Everybody recognises this is a big challenge for the area um, and it, we should be recognising it by putting it on the face of the bill and making it a name for the new agency. I'll give away to... Um, to, to, to Rachel Hamilton. Rachel taking, Hamilton. Thank you for taking the, the intervention. I too agree that uh, it's absolutely crucial to bring young people back to the south of Scotland um, for reasons that they have, cannot um, actually find affordable housing. It's important that um, it's, it's a crucial part of economic growth as well. And, and we will be supporting um, this amendment. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Um, on the, 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 the further amend amendment two, um, which clarifies the importance of support in, in rural businesses, um, it's been implied that somehow that will mean not support in urban businesses, which I think uh, shows a complete misunderstanding of the rest of the aims uh, in the bill itself. The, the aims of the bill talk about um, support and inclusive sustainable economic growth. It talks about encouraging business startups and entrepreneurships. It already covers all businesses, but there's a specific challenge when it comes to rural businesses, and that's recognising that sometimes in a small community, to make that community sustainable, you may need to create four or five jobs, and that is as important as creating 100 jobs in a larger town or city, but that's something that's been missing from the current economic development support that a region faces. And likewise, it's recognising the fact that in a rural community, you'll need additional support to make that happen and actually make a difference to communities. That's why it's important to specify that. And it also, I think, encompasses the importance of those industries from forestry to agriculture to aquaculture that will make a big difference to the economy of Dumfries and Galloway and the borders going forward. And that's why so many organisations, such as the NFU, very much support this amendment to the bill. I'll, I'll take an intervention, although I'm Mike finished Rumbles. there, but yeah. Well, he did say it was implied, because it wasn't implied at all. I said it straight, straight out that if you just put in, this, in, in stage three of this bill, if you just put in law supporting rural businesses in law in, in, in this stage three debate, mm -hmm. it can easily be interpreted as saying that urban businesses may not be supported. That's the point. We have no revising chamber. And at stage three, it's really important that we get this right. Colin Smith. Well, that, that, that interpretation would mean that, frankly, Mike Rumbles hasn't looked at the rest of the aims of the bill, which talks about encouraging business startups and entrepreneurship. These are covered, but the distinctive way in which we need to support rural businesses isn't covered. In the same way, you could argue we shouldn't have transport or support and digital connectivity because that excludes other things. That's a ridiculous um, statement to actually make. It does emphasise the importance of a focus on rural businesses for the new agency, and that's why um, I'm happy to support that amendment too, and um, the, the other amendment that's disappointingly others um, don't appear to be supporting. Thank you. Thank you. The member is there for pressing Amendment 9, and the question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 2 in the name of Colin Smith. Colin Smith to move or not move? move that is moved. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. Now, this is the first division of the day, so we're going to suspend for five minutes while I call the other members to the chamber. Suspend for five minutes.
Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, colleagues. We now resume. And we are now going to vote on Amendment 2 in the name of Colin Smith. And members may vote now. This is a 30-second division on Amendment 2. Two in the name of Colin Smith is yes, 53, no, 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 3 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary to move. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 10 in the name of Colin Smith. Already debated. Colin Smith to move. Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to division. Members may... Cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10 in the name of Colin Smith is yes, 52, no, 60. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 11 in the name of Joan McAlpine. Joan McAlpine to move. Moved. That's moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We, we are agreed. I call amendment 12 in the name of Emma Harper. Emma Harper to move. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And we move now to Group 2, the collaboration and cooperation with other bodies. I call Amendment 13 in the name of Claudia Beamish, grouped with Amendments 14 and 19. Claudia Beamish to move Amendment 13 and to speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I move the amendment in my name and declare an interest as a member of the cooperative group of members of the Scottish Parliament. This amendment would add to the aims in section five, a requirement to, I quote, encourage persons and bodies with an interest in the environment to cooperate in achieving environmental objectives. I brought this back from stage two because I strongly believe that it should be on the face of the bill. It would enable and facilitate, he's not listening, a whole, a whole range of bodies and individuals such as farmers, land managers and communities, urban and rural, to work together. The amendment would encourage groups to take environmental projects forward on a cooperative model. I emphasize this is not only about collaboration, but a more robust model of cooperation. I'm disappointed the cabinet secretary does not grasp the importance of this. In, comment, in commenting on the amendment at stage two, he stated, it is essential that everyone works together and cooperates, but it's not really about the agency. The bill is not really telling about telling third parties what to do. That does not really come under the scope of the bill. People need to work together across the whole scope of government. That is expected and desirable. But this is not really within the scope of any bill that, uh, that establishes a new body to state that third parties should co cooperate. That should happen anyway. The persons and bodies interested in this model should be, would be self-selecting. There would be no obligation. The amendment is not about should, but it is about could. This is not about telling people what to do, which is what the... Cabinet Secretary stated um, is his interpretation of it at stage two. It is about facilitating cooperative action. The Cabinet Secretary also stated at stage two that, though, that with an environmental interest was a vague term. I disagree with this, and I will give some examples, which are all things that would be far more difficult on an individual small scale for farmers, land managers, and community groups to do without the support and advice on working cooperatively. One would be river-wide uh, river basin wide work, for example, such actions as riparian tree planting to mitigate flooding and bring shade to salmon spawning grounds. 
Another is the removal of non-native invasive plant species such as giant hogweed from a wide area, uh, less worth doing on a small scale due to the likely continuing spread in spite of being tackled. Another is agroforestry schemes, which would enable action which, because of the economies of scale, would make tree planting more possible across smaller land holdings in a way that would be otherwise more difficult. And my final example is woodland planting, of which there are many good examples by communities already, and this would enhance it further, such as Peebles and other places in South Scotland, which are doing this work already. The amendment would support and facilitate communities to work on, on, on that and these other issues and many more with advice from the agency and support. In view of the recent United Nations report on nature and the extinction warnings therein and the IPCC warning about remaining below 1.5 degrees, the new commitment by the Scottish Government to net zero emissions by 2045, which is welcome, and more broadly the climate and the environment emergencies, and the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to look at all policies uh, in, this, in these contexts, or certainly in the context of climate change, I am clear that this amendment adds to the aims in a way which would facilitate a cooperative approach to positive environmental and climate change objectives. This support for cooperation for environmental purposes is surely exactly the sort of policy marker which the Scottish Government should be making explicit on the face of this relevant bill. This amendment is in the public interest in view of these imperatives. And I hope that even at this late stage, in view of the arguments I have put forward, the Cabinet Secretary will reconsider his position and agree to my amendment. In but terms of the other... <laughs> you'll be pleased to hear, Presiding Officer, I'm going to leave the other two amendments to those who are moving them at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Beamish. I call Maureen Watt to speak to Amendment 14 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. During the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee's consideration of the bill, it was clear that with a number of bodies operating in the south of Scotland, it would be important to ensure that the new agency did not duplicate existing activity, but would enhance the current landscape. Amendment 14 makes it clear that in working to deliver its aims, the new agency should encourage and facilitate collaboration. Collaboration can effectively contribute towards advancing the aims of the agency, whether that collaboration and cooperation be between, be between the various agencies operating the region or between other persons or bodies. Claudia Beamish and Colin Smith similarly recognise the need for collaboration and cooperation to be mentioned in the bill, but their amendments place a narrower focus on the purpose of that collaboration or the bodies involved. Collaboration will be important to the delivery of all the aims of the new agency, whether that be environmental, economic or social. We should not be prescriptive about that collaboration. This amendment in my name seeks to emphasise the importance of the new agency, both working collaboratory, collaboratively and promoting collaboration in pursuit of its aims. It provides the necessary flexibility to drive collaboration and cooperation in the most appropriate way and with the most appropriate bodies. I ask members to support Amendment 14. Thank you. And I call Colin Smith to speak to Amendment 19 and the other amendment in the group. Thank you, President Officer. Amendment 19 in my name places a duty on the new agency to facilitate cooperation between relevant bodies. This serves a specific purpose around the practical operations of public bodies in the region. It's not just about supporting the broad concept of cooperation, but making it a requirement. There's no doubt that one of the, the key concerns local stakeholders raised with the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee at stage one was how the new agency would work with existing bodies. The risk of duplication or gaps was raised and the need for a cohesive collaborative approach achieving aims was stressed by most stakeholders. The new agency will be working alongside Scottish Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland, Business Gateway, the Scottish Funding Council, two local authorities, whatever governance structure is introduced to run the Borderlands Initiative and many, many others. The cluttered landscape and concerns over poor cooperation between existing bodies has been a real problem in the region in the past and as we add a new agency to the existing list we cannot afford a repeat in the future. Simply saying cooperation will happen is not as robust as underpinning this in legislation. The, the REC committee's 
The right committee recognised that in stage one in a report which called for, and I quote, the development of appropriate mechanisms to facilitate collaboration and coordination between the new agencies and all of the various existing agencies operating in the region, including the strategic board. One example of such a mechanism was provided by the leader of Dumfries and Galloway Council, Elaine Murray, and her evidence on behalf of the council and on behalf of all the groups on that council, where she suggested a memorandum of understanding between the various public authorities. In my amendment, I'm not being prescriptive about what approach should be taken, but unless we make this collaboration a priority, indeed a legal requirement, then we can talk all we like about promoting improved transport or digital connectivity, but it will be meaningless unless there is a clear cooperation across agency, and the best way to focus minds on the need for that is to make it a legal requirement. Amendment 13 by Claudia Beamish calls for the agency to take on a, a role in encouraging cooperation for the purposes of achieving environmental aims. This cooperation could cover a whole range of, of models from formal cooperatives to catchment based cooperation to general collaboration. This is clearly a positive move and given the new agency will have a social and environmental remit as well as an economic one, I think it's fair to ask them to play a role in encouraging this kind of work. And finally, Amendment 14 by Maureen Watt likewise calls for the agency to play a facilitating role when it comes to collaboration within the region. Again, I think this is a worthwhile addition uh, and I tabled the same wording, but I do not believe the new agency having that needs to have something of a leadership role in the region on issues relevant to its aims, uh, and I don't think this amendment goes far enough to deliver that. However, I do believe, uh, I don't believe it is in any way a substitute for Amendment 19, as Maureen Watt seemed to uh, imply. I think it will complement Amendment 19. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call the Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Representing also Amendments 13, 14 and 19 all seek in differing ways to impress upon the new agency the importance of working collaboratively and promoting collaboration. A culture of cooperation has been a key characteristic of the work across the South to date, taken forward by the South of Scotland Economic Partnership. Indeed, we have already seen the willingness of the partnership to work with other agencies and communities to deliver for the region. I am confident that the relationships it has forged and the fresh dynamic it has brought to discussions and activities will continue. This government strongly encourages cooperation and alignment to deliver maximum impact. It's a theme that we highlight a, firstly in strategic guidance letters that we issue to agencies and therefore I would intend doing similarly in the guidance letter to South of Scotland Enterprise. Secondly, it's a key theme of the work of the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board which by its very existence is concerned with creating greater synergy and alignment across planning of our enterprise and skills agency. In addition, the chair of the new agency will be a member of that strategic board. We are also, thirdly, committed to establishing regional economic partnerships across Scotland. Also, I don't think it would make sense for all of these three amendments, which seek to do the same thing, uh, to make it into the bill. Saying the same thing in legislation several times, in slightly different words, tends not to make the law clearer, but more confusing. I would therefore encourage members to support Maureen Watt's amendment and to reject the others in this group. And I, I want to set out the reasons why that's the case. Amendment 14 is the most complete statement about the sort of collaboration that I'm sure everyone across the chamber wants to see the new agency engage in and promote. It makes it clear that the new agency should work it, it collaboratively with others and encourage and facilitate others to work cooperatively amongst themselves to support the delivery of all of the agency's aims. That is furthering sustainable economic and social development and improving the immunity and environment of the South of Scotland. In contrast, Amendment 13 from Claudia Beamish relates only to collaboration around environmental aims. Now, I welcome Ms Beamish lodging that amendment to highlight the undoubted importance of collaborating around environmental goals. But if the bill were to underscore the importance of collaboration on environmental matters only, it would suggest that collaboration around economic and social development is of lesser importance. I don't think that's the message that anyone, including Ms Beamish, would want this legislation, which is to set up an enterprise agency to send. Colin Smith's Amendment 19 is also narrower than Amendment 14, whereas Amendment 14, and for that matter, 13, is concerned rightly with the promotion of cooperation amongst all persons, be they public, private or third sector, Amendment 19 is limited with, to dealing with cooperation in the public sector. It doesn't refer to 
bodies in the private sector or in the third sector. And it further confines the agency's role to facilitating cooperation between itself and other public authorities operating in the region, rather than acknowledging that it might also wish to encourage cooperation between and with any public body who may play a part uh, in achieving the agency's aims, even if those public bodies operate or are based out with the region. The result is that Amendment 19 ignores the importance of the agency working cooperatively with, for example, neighbouring uh, local authorities, such as in Ayrshire and South Lanarkshire, uh, in spite of the committee expressing a strong view during stage one that it would want the agency to work in cooperation with those neighbouring authorities. Uh, for these reasons, uh, Presiding Officer, I encourage members to support Maureen Watt's Amendment 14, which is helpful in fostering cooperation and collaboration in an expansive way and reject the others in this group. Thank you very much. And no other member wishes to come to contribute. I will ask Claudia Beamish to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 13. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, in reference to Amendment 19, um, how the new agency will work with existing bodies and the need for a co cohesive and collaborative approach. This has been stressed by stakeholders, as Colin Smith uh, stated in, in his remarks. And the reference to a cluttered landscape by Colin Smith is really important because the, the lines of communication have to be really clear in relation to collaboration. And while I take the point, um, as a resident of Clydesdale and representing the whole of the region of South Scotland about um, uh, working with other local authorities that aren't included within the South Scotland um, agency, I don't think this is an exclusive amendment. I think it's inclusive in terms of collaboration. And so uh, it's disappointing that the Cabinet Secretary is not um, prepared to support it. I think clarity on that amendment uh, would have been bought by having it on the face of the bill. And... Um, I would also argue in relation to my own amendment, um, although I don't want to uh, add very much to that, that um, in view of the climate and environment emergencies, I believe it is the dereliction of duty of the Scottish Government not to support that amendment in relation to environmental cooperation. And it doesn't prevent, um, or, or it, it isn't exclusive in that way, and doesn't prevent social and economic cooperation from happening. It simply emphasises the importance of this in relation to um, the climate emergency. Uh, so um, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, see where we go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Beamish. So the question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote, and this will be a one-minute division. Amendment 13, one minute. The result of the vote on amendment number 13 in the name of Claudia Beamish is yes, 53, no, 59. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 14 in the name of Maureen Watt. Maureen Watt to move. Move, presiding move. officer. Thank you. The question is that amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I'm going to turn now to group three, consultation on action plan. I call Amendment 15 in the name of Colin Smith, grouped with Amendments 16 and 17. Colin Smith to move Amendment 15 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. Amendments 15, 16 uh, and 17 in my name set out requirements and timescales for the new agency to review and consult on its action plan. 
During stage two, I put forward a number of amendments on this issue and agreed to consider feedback on those from the committee. The principle, however, remains exactly the same. Consulting with communities will be essential to the work of the new agency, and I believe the bill must include clear statutory requirements in this regard. We need an agency that is for the south of Scotland and is very much rooted in the south of Scotland. And unless we find local solutions to the local challenges and opportunities facing the economy and communities in the region, then the agency will not deliver on its aims. And that means listening to the communities within the south of Scotland. So Amendment 17 places a requirement on the new agency to consult before making its first action plan and within a maximum of five years after that. It's important that the agency's action plan is kept up to date to ensure it is always relevant to the needs and priorities of the region and consultant on the plan on a regular basis will help achieve this. The maximum five-year window delivers the flexibility needed to allow the agency to make plans on their own terms and to synchronise with those of other enterprise agencies. But I would stress that the five-year period is a maximum. We should fully expect the agency to revise its plan often enough so that this upper limit does not need to be enforced and to also ensure that ongoing consultation and community engagement is part of the regular activity of the new agency. Local input in any consultation is essential. The agency needs to reflect the views of the people whom it serves. So my amendment makes clear that the new agency must consult with those who live and work in the south of Scotland and also businesses and public bodies that operate in the south of Scotland. However, I consider it crucial that local authorities have the opportunity in particular to respond and the amendment makes provision for that at section, subsection 3 of Amendment 17. This makes clear the new agency must specifically seek the views from Dumfries and Galloway Council and Scottish Borders Council. Subsection 4 of Amendment 17 requires the new agency to report on what it will do in response to views obtained through the consultation process. And in the interest of transparency, that report must be sent to Scottish ministers, local authorities and then laid before Parliament. Amendments 15 and 16, which are also part of this group, are technical amendments uh, should Amendment 17 be approved. So, President Officer, I therefore formally move Amendment 15 in my name. Thank you very much. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, I'm happy to support these amendments which address key issues of whom to consult with, when to consult and how often, and what it should do with the consultation findings. These give effect to key matters raised at stage two, but without imposing an unduly bureaucratic burden on the agency. By stating that the action plan must be reviewed at least every five years, Amendment 17 ensures that the new agency's planning cycle can be synchronized with the other enterprise agencies. I'm pleased that, that the amendment also expressly states that the new agency must consult those who live and work in the south of Scotland, as well as businesses and public authorities uh, who operate in the south, including both local authorities who are critical partners for the new agency. I hope members uh, will join the government in supporting these amendments. Thank you very much. And does Colin Smith wish to add anything to his previous comments? No. In that case, we move to the vote. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 16 in the name of Colin Smith. Colin Smith to move. Move. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 17 in the name of Colin Smith. Colin Smith to move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I turn now to Group 4, powers not to be used to contribute to arms trade. I call Amendment 1 in the name of John Finney in a group on its own. John Finney to speak to and move Amendment 1. Thank you very much indeed, uh, President Officer. Throughout de deliberations and scrutiny of this bill, um, much has been made of the, the comparator with Highlands and Islands Enterprise. And with regard to um, uh, monies provided with companies, um, I've asked over a, a number of years, as have colleagues from uh, Green colleagues, about the role of uh, public monies and the defence sector. Indeed, in 2017, I asked a series of questions and uh, culminating in a meeting with the Chief Executive of Highlands and Islands Enterprise when um, she explained that, for instance, in an actual example, a company may manufacture batteries, and that battery could be used in a, in a motor vehicle, could also be used in a tank. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're working for the defence sector. I got a breakdown of monies that had been provided, and I was assured that there was no promotion of that. You can therefore imagine my surprise when the following week, I received an invitation from Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and I'll read it out to you, um, President Officer. Aerospace and defence sector opportunities in the region highlighted at the event. Businesses in the Highlands and Islands are invited to a free workshop to find out how the region can benefit from opportunities in the aerospace, defence, security and space industries. 
and it was held in, in Inverness. Now, it goes on to say, the event is organised by Highlands and Islands Enterprise at ADS Scotland. Now, for members who uh, don't know who ADS Scotland are, and this is from their actual website, um, ADS is the, found, and I quote here, is the founding partners of the Defence Growth Partnership, which aims to secure a thriving UK defence sector, delivering long-term security, growth and prosperity for our nation. As a partnership between industry and government, the DGP is an important part of generating high-tech export-led growth. Yes, certainly. Rachel Hamilton. I think very intently um, to uh, the, the member. However, do you have any examples about the south of Scotland in, in this instance, or are you using the Highlands and Islands as an example that could... Could you tell the Chamber why you're using this as an example, please? John Finney. Well, um, I'm grateful the member's listening intently, and if she continues to listen intently, um, hopefully it will become clear. They are, of course, comparator bodies, and that's what I started off by saying. Um, the DGP is working to, and I quote here, grow the UK's global market share through increased exports, foster greater collaboration and innovation across the sector, bringing products and services to market to, that meet the customer, improve competitiveness through the whole value chain. Now, I brought an amendment at stage two, um, which covered a range of aspects, um, including um, uh, lots that could be made available to the, the, uh, the military. And um, I was assured by a number of members that it was far too expansive, far too expansive. So what I've come back with at stage three is a, an amendment which, uh, as members will note, mentions the word munitions. And you may ask where that word comes from. It's frequently cited by the Scottish Government. Indeed, my, my colleague Ross Greer um, asked a question of the Scottish Government um, in, uh, last year. What information it had regarding any, whether any companies that it provides financial support to have supplied weapons or equipment that might have been used in the alleged war crimes in Yemen by the Saudi Air Force. And the reply from the Minister Paul Hailshouse was, and I quote here, the Scottish Government has not used public monies to support the manufacture or export of munitions from Scotland. Um, which is... Um, uh, at the yes, certainly. David Stewart cross-party or great support in this chamber for funding of the spaceport in Sutherland um, that High has got great funding in this does the member object to High funding the spaceport? John Finney. Well the, the member will know as I do that there are a number of com competitions uh, for, for uh, space monies in the Highlands and uh, High is actively involved now in I'm actually talking about the defence sector here. Um, the, the, rea the reality is that again um, when uh, asked um, what what the definition of munitions was, uh, uh, Minister, uh, Mr. McKee said the definition for munition is, quote, a weapon or ammunition, particularly for military use. Scotland's enterprise agencies do not support the manufacture or export of munitions. Certainly. Oliver Mundell. And uh, that the member may have very different uh, views from me on some of these issues, but does he not recognise it's a bit odd uh, to rule out uh, making munitions for UK armed forces uh, anywhere in the south of Scotland? John Finney. Uh, no, I don't personally think it's remotely odd at all. Um, the, um, can I, I, I then move to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee at stage two when this um, issue was discussed, and as I say, a more expansive um, uh, amendment. Fergus Hugh, the Cabinet Secretary, said, and I quote here, as the First Minister has made clear, the Scottish Government and its enterprise and skills agencies do not provide funding for the manufacture of munitions. Our enterprise uh, agencies do not support the manufacture of munitions. Now, if that's the case, I can't see why there would be any issue whatsoever, whatsoever in the Scottish Government supporting this amendment. I understand they don't plan to. Turning to the south of Scotland, Penman Engineering in Dumfries received uh, funding from Scottish Enterprise. Penman's products include armoured vehicles for military purposes. Uh, um, armoured vehicles for military purposes one of their products is, uh, I'm told here, a Metra MRV, which looks similar to a Humvee. And uh, I'm hearing the minister tell me that it's ambulances. Well, the promotional vehicle shows it with a machine gun mounted on the top. Um, <laughs> that's not my idea. Not my idea of an ambulance with a machine gun. And in 2000... The member, uh, the member will take an intervention. Minister Paul Wheelers. Um, obviously, the risk of speaking of a sedentary position, they may have misheard. I was saying they also make ambulances. Which is the point, just to clarify the point I made. Which Thank you for that reversed. clarification, John Finney. Well, I, I'm a big fan of ambulances, I have to say, and, uh, and if they can be manufactured in the south of Scotland, then that's, that's really good. Um, and uh, 
in 2012, they applied for an export license for military vehicles to Saudi Arabia. Previously applied for export licenses to military vehicles in, in Libya. Now, we're repeatedly told that um, diversification is what it's all about, and, uh, and I think that that's commendable. Um, but uh, I, I can't see, I can't see. Yes. Oliver Mundell. I thank the member for giving way again. Can you confirm uh, for my constituents whether or not he intends this amendment to rule out future funding for Penman Engineering, uh, or whether he recognises that they don't, in fact, make munitions? John Finney. I didn't quite catch the, the end, but if the member reads the amendment, you'll see that I, I would rule out any funding for munitions, yes. Oliver Mundell. For the point of clarification, I'm saying that Penman's Engineering in Dumfries don't make munitions. Uh, does the member agree with that point? John Finney. Uh, well, I've read out to you the information I have regarding that. If they don't make munitions, that's good. That's really good, yeah. Um, so, um, I, I, hope, I hope, given the undoubted support that there is from the Scottish Government for no funding made available for missions, munitions, uh, that they'll have no difficulty supporting this amendment. Thank you for saying that. Thank you very much. Mr Finney, I call Mike Rumbles. Well, after that... Uh, this amendment purports to be about the arms trade. This amendment is not about the arms trade. If you look at the Greens' own uh, amendment, it actually says they actually, in their amendment, define the arms trade as the, say, quote, the sale of munitions for domestic procurement. This is not about the arms trade, and it's a bit false to pretend that this is a debate about the arms trade, and that's how it's, well, you've had your say. You can come back later on. You are summing up. You are summing up. This is not about the arms trade, despite what we've heard from John Finney uh, just now. I mean, you know, what about domestic munitions for shotguns for farmers and all that sort of thing if a company wanted to set up in the south of Scotland? This would run rings through that. Now, I spent 15 years in the army. Uh, and as long as we have an army, they will need to have munitions. I hope that we all agree with that. Uh, or do the Greens, or do the Greens not want us to have an army with munitions, or do they not want us to have an army at all? Let's be honest in this sort of debate. This is a remarkably daft amendment. If I'm allowed to say that, presiding officer, it is a daft amendment. It wasn't supported by anybody else at stage two. It shouldn't be supported by anybody else other than the Greens in stage three. I hope we will resoundly send a message. If we have an army, they've got to have munitions, for goodness sake. Thank you. I call Finlay Carson to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the, the Conservatives on these benches will certainly not be uh, supporting uh, John Finney's amendment, uh, particularly in light of the suggestion that uh, it may involve uh, companies like Penman's in Dumfries or the helmet factory in Sonra that produces uh, cutting-edge uh, technology for, for helmets that go to the American Air Force and the gendarmes in France and whatever, and removing funding from them would be disaster for the south of Scotland, not only Stranar on its, its own. So we'll not be supporting uh, this amendment because I don't think it actually sets out to achieve what uh, John Finney would uh, intend it to do. Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And let me just uh, add uh, slightly to what's just been said. The purpose of the product of helmet integrated systems is safety helmets. In other words, they are for protecting people from the incidents that happen in the field of war. So the 100 people who are employed at Helmet Integrated Systems will be listening very carefully to this debate and the idea that uh, the South of Scotland Enterprise Board should be denied the opportunity to support that company and other innovative companies that are genuinely saving lives in the most hazardous of conditions. This is unsupportable. <laughs> And a call on the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we cannot support this amendment, uh, Presiding Officer, although we acknowledge Mr Finney's right to bring it back to the Parliament. Put simply, his amendment could still prevent the new agency from providing support to companies in the defence sector in the south of Scotland, even for activities for business development and diversification into other areas. As the First Minister has made clear, the Scottish Government and its enterprise and skills agencies do not provide funding for the manufacture of munitions. Our agency's support helps firms to diversify and develop non-military applications for their technology. We recognise the importance of the aerospace, defence and marine sectors in Scotland. They employ many young graduates in STEM subjects 
The agencies work proactively with these sectors to help them diversify their activities to grow and sustain employment. That position would apply to the new agency as well. Uh, Presiding officer, it's important to ensure that we do not restrict the flexibility of the new agency to be able to do so, and this revised amendment would do that. The defence, aerospace and marine sector in Scotland matters to our economy, and we do not wish to damage the contribution that companies in this sector make, or to be able to respond at some future date should exceptional circumstances relating to the defence of the state mean that we wish to provide support to a business to enable it to provide goods and services to the military. Uh, I too want to mention the company Helmet Integrated Systems, Gentex Europe in Stranraer. This employs over 100 people with a mixed range of skills and is a living wage employer. It has been based in the southwest Scotland since the 1980s. It currently manufactures safety helmets for police, fire and rescue crews as well as products for various industrial applications and specialist helmets for civil and military aircrew. In short, presiding officer, it provides equipment which keeps those who put themselves in the face of danger, often on a daily basis, safe. It uses its expertise, skills and knowledge to provide high quality equipment that those who undertake dangerous and risky work rely upon to keep them safe. Far from being the sort of employer that this government and indeed its en enterprise agencies should stop supporting, it is exactly the sort of business we wish to continue to help should the need arise in the future. I urge members to oppose this amendment. Thank you. And I call John Finney to wind up and to, uh, to press or withdraw his amendment. Uh, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. Uh, some interesting contributions and it would be an excellent of the individuals who had contributed and actually look at the amendment rather than what they presumed the amendment to be. Mr Rumbles, for instance, in the previous uh, um, iteration of the amendment somehow thought this was trying to interfere with the military involvement in emergencies like flooding. Um, um, a previous member thought I was trying to attack the knitwear industry in the borders. <laughs> um, um, and I have to say, do you know, unless helmets are being used as weapons, and I don't think anyone's suggesting, then I wish all of these companies every success. Diversification, of course, is bandied about a lot, and we've been told, indeed, in an official response to, to this group, we were told that Lockheed Martin, the largest arms manufacturer in the world, was an IT company based in Aberdeen, was the official answer that we got. Now, the mantra of the Green Party is people, planet, and peace. If you, if you follow uh, this amendment and support it, you have an opportunity to do something positive. I hope you take that opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr Finney. And the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote, and this will be a one-minute vote on Amendment 1. The result of the vote on Amendment 1 in the name of John Finney is yes, 6, no, 107. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 19 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 13. Colin Smith to move? Move. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. This will be a 30-second vote. Amendment 19.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 19 in the name of Colin Smith is yes, 51, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Now, before we turn to Group 5, members may have noticed that we passed the agreed time limit for the debate on the previous group to finish. I exercise my power under Rule 9.8.4a to allow this group to uh, debate on this group to continue to avoid debate being unreasonably curtailed. However, we now turn to Group 5. We're about, just for members of information, we're about 10 minutes behind. On Group 5, Workers' Interest Committee, I call Amendment 4 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary in a group of its own. Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 4. Presiding officer, this government wants Scotland to be a world leading fair work nation by 2025. We believe that fair work is key to underpinning our economic success and the well being and prosperity of individuals, businesses, organisations, and society. More and better jobs and more and better working conditions. We know that the south of Scotland is a low pay region. We know there's a need to enhance productivity. We know that workers and employees' conditions and relationship with their work is key to that. And whilst we have seen welcome progress in closing the pay gap between men and women in the region and elsewhere in the rural economy, it persists. There are issues which contribute to inequality and in work poverty which constrain economic growth, incomes and the wealth of the region. These are issues which we are determined this agency will help to address and the establishment of a workers' interest committee will help achieve that. Amendment 4 will ensure that worker engagement is a core function of the agency and that workers' voices are heard and listened to. I envisage that this committee will encompass the widest range of workers' interests, including those who are employees, but also those who are self-employed. It's deliberately wide so that the new agency is informed by issues impacting on a broad range of working people. Uh, it is important the perspective all of those working in the south of Scotland are heard. At just over 20%, the south of Scotland has a much higher proportion of people who are self-employed than in Scotland as a whole at 12%. Indeed, among Scotland's 32 local authority areas, Dumfries and Galloway has the highest self-employment rate and Scottish borders the third highest self-employment rate at 22 and 19% respectively. So this is a specific, deliberate and concerted effort to ensure that the new agency considers what can be done to advance workers' interests, uh, which will not only deliver effective voice, but result in effective and credible policies and actions. Yes, certainly. Mike Rumbles. I wondered if you could just confirm that when we're talking about workers, it's not just the, the employees, but it's the wider, just that. Yes, yes, I'm happy to confirm that the term workers incorporates employees, but, but also those who are in self-employment, who are not uh, a Schedule E employees, a, a, but are self-employed for the reasons I've just stated as being particularly important in the south of Scotland. Uh, so um, I, I, I think it's important also to add, presiding officer, that I would expect this committee to include representation from business, which could be provided from organizations such as the Federation of Small Businesses, Chambers of Commerce and Institute of Directors, to name but a few. That will ensure that the new agency hears advice from different perspectives so that its actions are properly informed. This amendment complements Amendment 5, which we will come to shortly, requiring the government to issue a fair work direction to the agency, and also 7 and 8 in Group 8, which will ensure that the membership of the agency as a whole has experience or knowledge of the issues facing those who work in the south of Scotland. Finally, presiding officer, I want to thank the STUC for the constructive dialogue which I've had with them, which has helped put our social partnership into action. These discussions have been productive, and I know that the STUC welcomes the considerable progress that has been made on the matter of fair work. I want to build in these discussions as we implement the requirements in the bill to ensure that fair work is embedded in the new agency and the voice of workers is heard. I'm committed to doing so. I move Amendment 4. Thank you. I call Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I support Amendment 4 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, which creates a Workers' Interest Committee. At stage 2, I submitted 
an amendment calling for the agency's board to include trade union representation in order to ensure the board is responsive to the needs and concerns of workers in the region. And I have to say that remains my preferred position and the preferred position of the STUC. One of the biggest challenges this agency faces is around the need to tackle low pay and support the creation of high quality, well paid jobs in the south of Scotland. And trade unions have an essential role to play in this and a consistent trade union voice on the board would have been a big asset to the new agency. So while I'm disappointed that the government have not brought forward an amendment guaranteeing trade union representation on the board, I hope this committee will be given sufficient authority and power to ensure that the voice of workers is heard loud and clear in the work of the new agency. Thank you. Nicole Finley Carson. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, we welcome the, the amendment brought forward by uh, the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we had concerns regarding uh, the appointment of a trade union member on the board itself uh, and I think this is a good compromise uh, which recognises the above average uh, level of self-employed uh, workers in the south of Scotland uh, so we'll be supporting uh, the Cabinet Secretary's amendment. Does the Cabinet Secretary wish to add any comments? In that case we move to uh, the question. Does the Chamber agree that Amendment 4 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Turn to Group 6, Annual Report, a call Amendment 18 in the name of Colin Smith in a group of its own. Colin Smith to move and speak to Amendment 18. Thank you, President Officer. Um, amendment 18 in my name requires the agency's annual report to include an assessment of progress against both its aims as set out in this bill and its action plan. As it stands, the bill does not require the annual report to include any kind of performance monitoring. It only requires it to report on its activities, not their impact or outcomes. I think updating stakeholders and communities on delivery is essential. Amendment 18 guarantees this will happen on an annual basis and adds an important additional element of accountable, accountability. I therefore move Amendment 18 in my name. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do agree that annual reports are an important means of providing accountability and transparency that they should help to assure people, not least in the south of Scotland, that the agency is working to deliver on its functions, aims, and on the priorities identified through uh, consultation in its action plan. Uh, annual reports should demonstrate impact and outcomes from the agency's activities. That's precisely why the existing section 14 of the bill, presenting officer, already makes clear that uh, the agency, and I quote, must, after each financial year, prepare and publish a report of its activities during the year. Um, there is also another way to ensure this happens. As part of our governance arrangements with each public body, we agree a framework document. This is a requirement of the Scottish Public Finance Manual. In that document, we set out requirements for annual reports and accounts in relation to outlining bodies' main activities and performance against agreed objectives and targets. It will therefore make abundantly clear what an annual report on activities should say. So, whilst I do understand and support the intention behind Mr Smith's amendment, I don't believe it really adds anything necessary to the legislation. It is, I would respectfully submit, self-evident that an annual report should cover delivery on its aims and priorities. I hope Mr Smith agrees and will withdraw his amendment. And Colin Smith to wind up press or withdraw amendment 18. President Officer, I have to say, if, if something is going to happen, which the Cabinet Secretary says will happen, then I don't see the, the, the problem with including that in the bill, unless, actually, maybe it's not going to happen. It's a very small amendment that makes clear that the annual report should include performance monitoring. That's not specified in the bill as things currently stand. Uh, and therefore, this small amendment, I think, is something that I find uh, difficult to understand why anybody would oppose. So I'm happy to move uh, to, to, to pro press the amendment in my name. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and this will be a one minute division on Amendment 18.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 18 in the name of Colin Smith is yes, 53, no, 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We turn to Group 7, Fair Work Direction, and I call Amendment 5 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary in a group of its own. Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to amendment. I undertook at Stage 2 to consider what, if anything, we might be able to put in the face of this bill to further our ambitions on fair work. That required careful deliberation because these are linked to reserve matters and we need to be certain that anything we put in the bill is within legislative competence and would not create difficulties for the new agency. Amendment 5 works within the constraints on legislative competence to ensure that fair work is embedded in the approach we expect South of Scotland Enterprise to take. It requires Scottish ministers to issue a direction to the new agency to make clear we expect it to promote fair work in all it does. In that direction, we will set out our expectations of what the new agency should take forward. I anticipate significant alignment to the Fair Work Action Plan this government published last year. The amendment also requires that those representing the interests of workers and employers in the region are consulted about the Fair Work Direction before it is made. This gives effect to our commitment that the new enterprise agency will act as an exemplar in this area to establish the dimensions of fair work, namely effective voice, opportunity, security, fulfillment and respect, both in its role as an employer and also in its activities with business. As members will recognise, we do not use uh, direction-making powers lightly. The fact that we have taken a specific power affirms our determination to make fair work more than just an aspiration. Given that the committee recommended in its stage one report that we include furthering fair work in the bill's aims, I hope members will accept that I've sought to give effect to that call and will support this amendment. I move amendment five. Thank you very much and, oh, Colin Smith. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. I very much welcome Amendment 5 uh, by the Cabinet Secretary, which calls for a, a fair work direction to be issued to the agency setting out its responsibilities uh, in this regard. I think the agency has a vital role to play in promoting fair work in the region, and at stage two, I press for the bill to be amended to reflect this. The promotion of fair work will help to tackle many of the challenges facing the region, particularly around pay and working conditions, and indeed it will help the agency achieve a number of its other aims. I think it's important that the agency's responsibilities with regards to fair work are clearly set out in the bill so they are not considered either optional or secondary to the aims included in the bill. So I'm content this approach provides a way of delivering this while avo avoiding the legal challenge of legislating in what is a reserve matter, namely employment law. I'm therefore happy uh, to support uh, the amendment. Thank you. Does the Cabinet Secretary wish to add anything? We go straight to the question. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And I turn now to Group 8, South of Scotland Enterprise Membership. I call Amendment 6 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendment 7, 7, 8 and 8. The Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 6 and speak to all the amendments. 6, 7 and 8 focus on the skills and expertise required of members of South of Scotland Enterprise. Creating a new agency is an opportunity to bring a fresh approach to economic development in the South of Scotland. Members of the agency will be key to shaping its culture and approach in delivering for the interests and the needs of the area, so it's vital for agency members to have the right mix of skills and expertise. As demonstrated by the Gender Representation and Public Boards Act 218, this government is committed to improving the diversity of our boardrooms, ensuring that they are properly representative of modern Scotland, and importantly, to ensure public boards benefit from a wider range of skills, knowledge and expertise. While South of Scotland Enterprise will be subject to the provisions of the 218 Act, Amendment 6 seeks to go further in terms of encouraging diversity in its membership. Subparagraph 2A of Paragraph 1 in Schedule 1 was added at Stage 2. I listened carefully to the views expressed by a number of committee members during the debate on that amendment, and in particular the need to ensure that the issues facing workers of the region are represented on the board. One of the key issues for the region is the need to increase the working age population and to encourage more young people to stay in the area and to move to the area to live and work. That is now rightly recognised in subsection 2 BA of section 5. But it's also right that the agency's membership reflects this aspiration. And there is a risk that by emphasising the importance of members having both knowledge and experience, paragraph 1 to A in its current form could inhibit people who lack experience particularly young people from becoming agency members. Uh, that is why, to address those concerns, uh, which a number of members expressed at stage two, Amendment 6 
would change the emphasis of paragraph 12a so that it refers to having either knowledge or experience, ensuring that the membership criteria does not inhibit young people applying to be members will open up opportunities to hear the voice of young people and shows our commitment to seek opportunities to deliver a legacy from our year of young people in 2018. Amendments 7 and 8 address workers' representation, a key dimension of fair work and providing effective work. Taken with Amendment 5, requiring a fair work direction, and Amendment 4, establishing a workers' interest committee, which we have already debated, presiding officer, these amendments uh, will sustain a culture of fair work and fair work practices in the long term, making the consideration of workers' interests the norm within the agency. For these reasons, I ask members to support these three amendments in my name. I hope that my explanation of why we are proposing changing and to or in Amendment 6 will persuade uh, Colin Smith of the best intentions of this change. I'm seeking to be as inclusive as possible here Accordingly, I hope he will now not press his Amendment 7A, but if he does, I would ask members not to support it. And I call Colin Smith to speak to Amendment 7A. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can, can I firstly touch on um, the, the, the amendment by the, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Amendment 6, um, uh, which I think would be a step backwards from what is currently within the Bill as it stands. Um, the Bill describes the need for the membership to be taken as a whole to have experience and knowledge. It does not refer to members individually. So at no point does it say that members individually have to have knowledge and experience. It simply, has to, it simply says that the whole board should have knowledge um, uh, and experience. So this amendment would change that so that the board as a whole need only have experience or knowledge. And I believe its membership overall should have members with both experience um, uh, uh, and knowledge uh, uh, as a whole. Now, given that the bill is very clear that the current provision relates to the, the board as a whole, a whole, the consequence of this amendment means the entire board could have experience but no knowledge of the region or vice versa. Now, the justification for this amendment appears to be to ensure young people uh, are able to sit on the board. However, I think it is somewhat patronising to suggest young people living in the region don't have any experience of the region. Now, experience as a young person living in the region is exactly what we need on this board. And regardless, the wording as it stands would not prevent any individual, um, including young people, with only experience or knowledge from sitting on the board. As I reiterate again, it refers to the board as a whole. Therefore, this is a completely unnecessary change and one which risks allowing for this quite absurd situation where the entire board may have no experience or knowledge of the region, and I think that's what we call unintended uh, consequences. Uh, amendment 7 uh, by um, Fergus Ewan likewise opts for a or rather than an and, and Amendment 7A in my name seeks to change this again. Every subsection here refers to the board's membership taken as a whole. It does not apply to every individual member. In my view, Amendment 7 is already a disappointing addition to the bill, which falls short of the dedicated trade union representation I wanted to see. I see absolutely no benefit to weakening this further by requiring the board to have either knowledge or experience of the issues facing workers in the region, rather than the board as a whole, including members with a combination of both. So I, I move Amendment 7A in my name. Thank you very much. I call Mike Rumbles to be followed by Finlay Carson. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to commend the Cabinet Secretary for these amendments. Um, I particularly um, wanted to see this in the bill. Uh, it's not, there are unintended consequences with this. It is a deliberate measure. Uh, the Cabinet Minister has listened uh, to uh, the evidence that we've presented and, uh, and, and the points that we've made. I was particularly concerned that when we advertise out of the usual channels for membership of the board in the south of Scotland. We did not want to put off young people in particular in any form for applying to be considered as members of the board. And when we put in legislation that members of the board have to have experience and knowledge of the issues facing uh, mm -hmm. those who work in the south of Scotland, that could be off-putting to some young people, of course. Michelle Hamilton. Um, Colin Smith makes the point that this is regarding the membership as a whole, taken as a whole, not individually. So I agree entirely with the sentiment that experience or knowledge is important. However, when you look at it as a whole, experience and knowledge is important. May Rumbles. I couldn't agree more. But the point I'm making and the point that is being missed is that if we are thinking outside the box and we are thinking about out with the usual channels to get young people 
on the board of the South. Let me make, th let me address the point before you try and <laughs> intervene. If we are going to think outside the box, and the minister is going to uh, uh, and uh, be in charge of this process, uh, if people see that on the face of the bill or any advert that may go out that members have to have experience and knowledge, it could certainly put off people from applying. This is the evidence that has been put to me. And I put that to the cabinet secretary and he listened. And I think this would be a backward step if we went back to the original form. So I understand the intentions and I understand the issue that the board as a whole can have knowledge uh, and um, experience but it can put people off. And if we're in the business of change and we're in the business of doing things differently, I think we've got to make every effort to encourage young people to take part. Thank you. Finlay Carson. It, it's clarification. It's, it's very confusing. Perhaps the Cabinet Secretary, as a lawyer, can clarify this. Um, in the, uh, the, the bill, as amended at stage two, it suggests that to ensure that the membership, and as Colin Smith has already said, taken as a whole, has experience and knowledge of the whole of the south of Scotland. Surely adding or uh, could uh, imply that the board could simply have all experience or simply have all yeah, knowledge. As a lawyer, maybe the cabinet secretary could explain why we needed a change from the, the bill as amended at stage two. Stuart Stevenson. Presiding officer, one of the great problems, uh, youngsters leaving the education system, is getting the first job. When I was a graduate, I had three job offers with a humble degree. Ain't the case now. Um, I have family members who spent three years better qualified than me before they got a proper job. We need to make sure that we don't create barriers in the minds of applicants and we don't create barriers in the process of application to people who are probably better qualified than many with experience and would bring that knowledge to bear to the problems that face the south of Scotland, where it is particularly difficult to retain young people. I certainly will not be supporting 7A. And Cabinet Secretary, to wind up. Hey, well, I, I've uh, listened and enjoyed the, the debate, uh, and it's our desire and intention that we should not uh, deter young people from seeking to apply uh, and if they do apply if appropriate to become members of this new enterprise board. It's absolutely right that we avoid doing anything which uh, stops that or discourages that is the point that Mr. Steve, well hang on a second I'll maybe give away later but Mr. Stevenson made that point and he is absolutely right. Um, views were imputed to me about this uh, which, well, no, I won't. Uh, views have been imputed to me by Mr. Smith, which not only do I not hold, but I would never dream of holding, far less expressing. And that's unfortunate. But I can confirm that I am not suggesting that all young people have had no experience. That would be an absurdity. What I'm saying is that many young people, for various reasons, have not had the opportunity, the opportunity to amass, to gather experience of life and work beyond, for example, further and higher education. Uh, so I think it's abundantly clear that the incisive arguments put forward by Mr. Rumbles. Yes, I see there's lots of support for that sentiment, presiding officer. That the, incent, the incisive arguments put forward by Mr. Rumbles should be preferred. And we, at least, are determined that young people should not be left behind. But, but should play an active and positive and growing part in the business of South of Scotland enterprise as it does its job for the South of Scotland. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 6. We're not agreed. We'll move to vote. This is the first vote in the group, so it's a one-minute division. Amendment 6.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 6 in the name of Fergus Ewing is yes, 68, no, 45. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 7 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary to move. That is moved. I call Amendment 7A in the name of Colin Smith. Colin Smith to move. Uh, move. That is moved. So the question is that Amendment 7A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division, a 30-second division. Members, we cast the votes now on Amendment 7A. The result of the vote on amendment number 7A in the name of Colin Smith is yes, 52, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The question is that amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. No, we're not agreed. We'll move to a division and it's a 30 second vote. Members may cast their votes now. Amendment 7. The vote on amendment number seven in the name of Fergus Ewing is yes, 87, no, 27. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment eight in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary to move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment eight be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that ends consideration of amendments. Now, at this stage, as members may be aware, I am required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of this bill uh, relates to a protected subject matter. That is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In my view, it does no such thing. Therefore, it does not require a supermajority at stage three. So we're going to move on to the next item, which is a debate on stage three on motion 17517 in the name of Fergus Ewing on the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. And could I invite all members who wish to contribute to press their request to speak buttons? And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing, to open our debate. Open stage three debate on the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. This is a momentous day for the South Cabinet of Secretary, Scotland. Cabinet Secretary, one second. Could I just ask members please to keep the conversations down? There's a debate going on. Cabinet Secretary. Saying also, this is a momentous day for the south of Scotland, which will usher in a new era for Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. Uh, an era where the area has its own enterprise agency that's able to respond to different and distinct rural economy, able to drive inclusive and sustainable growth to benefit communities, and able to meet the needs and interests of all who live there. We all recognize the untapped potential of the south of Scotland, it has real strengths in traditional sectors like farming, forestry, fishing, and textiles. It has developed sectors like food and drink, tourism, and creative industries, and it has opportunity to contribute to the industries of the future, not least in the low carbon economy. It has a wealth of natural resources ready to contribute to the area's sustainable economic growth. It also has a wealth of people resources, ambitious for their area, entrepreneurial, with a sense of belonging, a lively culture, and enjoying a great quality of life. It's no accident that John Buchan's hero, David Hanney, sought sanctuary in the south of Scotland, in this blessed, honest-smelling hill country where every mile put me in better humor with myself. But we also recognize the region has challenges to overcome, low pay and productivity, gaps in connectivity and infrastructure, a declining and aging population where young people, sadly, do not always see or find reasons to stay. With this legislation, we have sought to establish an agency to lead on addressing those challenges. 
This bill sets out the legislative basis for a new agency with the right powers to take forward the right activities. It provides us with an agency that will further the sustainable economic and social development of the south of Scotland and which will seek to improve the amenity and environment of the area. It is clearly accountable to government, to this parliament and important locally. And of course the bill will now be an exemplar in delivering real progress on fair work practices. We set out to deliver a fresh and different approach and we have. Presiding officer, throughout this process, I have welcomed cross-party support for the bill's proposals. Since the bill's introduction in October, members have worked together to create legislation that provides a strong statutory framework for the new agency. The positive stage one debate confirmed MSP's support and we have worked since then to build consensus where it matters. I'm grateful for the work of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Commitment, uh, Committee and its careful scrutiny of the bill at stages one and two. Their thoughtful stage one report reflected their evidence gathering and helped inform amendments I and others made at stage two. I also welcome the consideration and input from the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Of course, passing the bill today is not the end of the story. The next chapter will focus on implementation. Work is already underway to translate law into an operational agency ready to start work on the 1st of April next year. South of Scotland Enterprise will be up and running in eight months time, signaling this government's intent to not just create an agency, but to deliver one. We want an agency with staff working across the region, delivering the activities that people want to see and that are set out in this bill. Our next step is to appoint the agency's chair and that process is now underway. We will then move on to appoint the agency's members. We are determined to ensure South of Scotland enterprise benefits from the right mix of skills and experiences. The amendments made today will, we believe, help deliver that diversity. Uh, and I hope that South of Scotland's MSPs will encourage people to apply. Presenting officer, in conclusion, with this legislation, we had the opportunity to be bold and to be ambitious, and we took it. It's a once in a generation opportunity to create a new enterprise agency, to provide for an agency which can transform the area's economy by building on its strengths and its traditions. An agency that creates opportunities for everyone, an agency that supports communities to thrive, and an agency that can make a real difference for individuals and businesses. I therefore move that the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill be passed. I now call Finlay Carson for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The creation of the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency was a manifesto commitment from uh, us on these benches ahead of the 2016 election. And I believe that today represents a hugely welcome and exciting step forward in addressing the barriers to the economic sustainability and ec economic growth in the communities I represent in Galloway and Western Fries and the wider South of Scotland region. Living and running a business in Galloway for over 35 years, I've always been aware of the unique nature of the economy in the South of Scotland. And I've always recognised the significant challenges my rural constituency faces, but more importantly, I've always known of the significant opportunities that we have. The 2016 Scottish Conservative Manifesto commitment recognised that the rural communities and businesses of the south of Scotland had unique economic needs similar to those faced uh, to the highland and island communities. And I welcome the fact that this government, the lead committee, and ultimately this bill before us now recognises and accepts these challenges and opportunities that exist in the south of Scotland. Today, in many ways, we're moving back to the, some, something similar to the old Dumfries and Galloway Enterprise Company model, but this time much improved with stronger local accountability and focus. And like Highlands and Islands Enterprise, with a socio-economic as well as simply an economic development emphasis. Dumfries and Galloway Enterprise, despite its weaknesses, was a body that helped support and create businesses that are still striving today. The South of Scotland enterprise can once again be the catalyst for economic growth and business creation in a region that so badly needs it. The bill as it stands today at stage three is one that the Scottish Conservatives will support at decision time. It has been progressed through the committee and there's been welcome measures to strengthen the bill and its aims for the better. 
Whilst there may be many situations where Colin Smith and I disagree, but on this occasion, I welcomed his amendment uh, that put in place a duty for the new body to facilitate, facilitate cooperation with other, other relevant bodies, and I'm pleased to see an amendment that has gone through on that basis. This will, in practice, ensure that the South of Scotland enterprise acts as a catalyst for future projects across the region, facilitating cooperation and joint working with other bodies, which will be key to the overall success. Those bodies might be Transport Scotland, Visit Scotland, Skill Development Scotland, or, yet, or the yet to be announced R100 delivery organisation to give a few examples. Throughout the bill consultation, uh, there has been a recognition that those sort of areas should be the focus of projects that will boost local infrastructure. And I know from the A75 roads upgrade petition that I've been running, that infrastructure is a, a really important um, uh, topic uh, and transport investment uh, is really important to my constituents. Whilst it's not appropriate for the new body to fund any infrastructure projects of the road building type, it would be absolutely appropriate for them to be the overarching agency, being the driving force behind necessary improvements, backed up by a close working relationship with the relevant body, in this case, Transport Scotland. This type of facilitation uh, can clearly move us towards a more cost-effective and accountable system where local residents and businesses know that there's an evidence-based plan of action to remove the barriers to economic sustainability. That action plan must recognise that the south of Scotland is ideally situated midway between the Scotland Central Belt and the Northern Powerhouse across the border. And it continues to be a great source of anger to me and my constituents, but I've got to do this, and I will take the opportunity to once again remind the government that Stranraer and its ports at Cairn Ryan are one of the most important gateways into Scotland, and the lack of appropriate investment in A75 and A77 should be a source of extreme embarrassment to this government. But I hope the new agency can assist the government in making the right road infrastructure decisions in the, nearly, in the very near future. During the consultation period for the agency, I received many comments that the engagement process must be straightforward and transparent, particularly for those pitching new projects. And the South of Scotland enterprise should act as a one-stop shop and avoid what many individuals and businesses have had to go through in the past, pushing, being pushed from pillar to post and having to jump through many different hoops when it comes to funding applications. Maureen Watt's amendment at stage two of this committee was welcomed in order to ensure that the new agency will be transparent and accountable to local people. And I welcome that amendment will now see the agency launch a consultation on its action plan. Uh, we also supported Colin Smith's amendment with regards to the consultation, consultation plan uh, undertaken by the new agency. And it's right that it should seek the views of local bodies, including the local authorities. But I do stress that the council should not be in a position to veto in any way or disproportionately influence or indeed delay uh, the agency from carrying out its function. By making the agency plan publicly available after consultation, the enterprise will be fulfilling a duty to the people of the south of Scotland to have made it clear that they have to play a part in the decision-making process. In addition, the requirement for review after five years gives confidence that there will be regular checks on how the agency plan uh, to deliver on the aspirations uh, we have today. During the 2016 election, as well as standing on uh, this manifesto commitment, I also stood on the platform of opposing further centralisation. That's why I welcome the bill uh, has been strengthened and Scottish ministers will need to consult the enterprise agency uh, given reasons before uh, changing or offering new directives. The south of Scotland for far too long has suffered from a lack of focus and investment, uh, resulting in many young people in particular moving away and also uh, the potential investors being put off by the lack of adequate infrastructure. I hope this afternoon, Wednesday the 5th of uh, June, heralds the dawn of a new era for the south of Scotland, when the local people of Dumfries and Galloway and the south of Scotland will have the start to have equity of access to tools and the funding so lacking in the past and to realise the true contribution that the people of south of Scotland have to offer the rest of the UK and beyond. Presiding officer, as the MSP for Galloway and West of Greece, I'm confident this is the first step in unlocking the massive untapped potential the natural resources people uh, and their skills have to offer and I look forward to seeing that on the ground. This region will not only be the most beautiful place to do business, but the best. Paul Colin Smith for up to five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Having campaigned for better support for the South of Scotland economy for 10 years, I welcome the fact we'll soon move uh, from the establishment of a South of Scotland enterprise agency being an issue for debate in this parliament to one of reality for communities across the South of Scotland. 
and it's important not to lose sight of why such an agency is needed. The reason I stood to be a member of this parliament in 2016 is because I saw every day as a local councillor chairing the Economy Committee and the South of Scotland Alliance that too many of the big economic challenges facing the area were simply not being addressed. The scandal of low pay where average earnings in Dumfries and Galloway were £11.52 per hour compared with a national average of £14.30 which makes the region the lowest paid in Scotland. The skill shortage were over a quarter of the population of the South of Scotland are graduates but the national figure is more than a third. The low levels of productivity and growth where gross value added per person in Dumfries and Galloway is 21% lower than the national average and 26% lower in the borders. But it's not just those challenges that weren't being properly tackled. The opportunities, the strengths, the huge potential of the area was not being fulfilled. The south of Scotland is an area of outstanding natural beauty with a historical and cultural heritage second to none. But our tourism potential is still in many ways untapped. There are sectors in the region that have a reputation for excellence, forestry, energy, arts and culture and many more, but there, there needs to be more focus from our economic activity, economic agencies to deliver the inclusive sustainable growth from those sectors our region needs. We have a strong, small and medium-sized business base providing so many opportunities to grow and create jobs with the right level of support, support that the current economic agency model has simply not delivered for the region. We have a vibrant, ambitious social enterprise base already making a difference to communities, but desperate to do more, desperate to access the same support offered to other businesses to help them achieve that. We also have the excellent local colleges and a university campus with the potential to expand so they can deliver more of the skills our communities need. Allocation means that parts of the south of Scotland are just two hours travel from 14 million people. That's 14 million potential customers in the central belt and the north of England. And crucially, the people of the south of Scotland have a real community spirit, a desire, a determination to make the south of Scotland better. That determination is why there is such strong support for the establishment of this new agency and why they now want to get on with making the agency a reality. I therefore want to place on record my thanks on behalf of my constituents to everyone who's delivered this legislation, paving the way for the agency, including, I have to say, the Cabinet Secretary for taking this bill through Parliament and for the strong interest he's taken in the south of Scotland economy. And while he picks himself up off the floor, I'll caveat that by saying a particular thanks to the South of Scotland Economic Development Team, uh, led by Karen Jackson, who supported the work of the Cabinet Secretary. Of course, I would have liked to have seen that the bill go further in terms of cooperation between agencies, more local accountability, tackling poverty, improving housing, trade union representation, and obviously using the word and instead of the word or. But I am pleased to have made some changes to the bill, strengthening the aims of the agency to include, for example, support and social enterprises, helping take forward the fair work agenda and crucially putting in place local consultation on the agency's action plan to make sure this is an agency rooted in the south of Scotland. And I appreciate on occasions this has often meant the government moving its position to ensure that these changes happen. But the people who deserve the most praise are, are those who have campaigned long and hard for this agency, who will now take this new agency forward and that's the people of the south of Scotland. I, I've got the privilege of living in the south of Scotland, in Dumfries and Galloway. I'm a, a proud Dunhamer, but it, it does break my heart to see so many young people leave the region, eh, not through choice, but because of the lack of high-skilled, well-paid jobs or the range of further and higher education opportunities to deliver the skills they want and our economy needs. If we look back in 10 years' time and we still have so many young people being forced to turn their back on the south of Scotland, then I think we'll have failed. So it's now up to all of us to get behind this new bill, to support this leg legislation today and to make this new agency a success, delivering the strong, vibrant local economy I know the south of Scotland can be. Colin John Finney, four minutes, please. Thank you very much indeed, President Officer. It's been, a, it's been a real pleasure to be involved in this legislation and uh, um, there's a number of people need to be thanked for that, as ever the clerks, the witnesses, the people of the South of Scotland, the representatives of the South of Scotland, because of course our committee was visited on a number of occasions by elected representatives from the South and uh, there's no doubting the enthusiasm and energy that they brought and, uh, and the additional uh, contribution they gave. Um, like others, I, I would uh, also thank the Cabinet Secretary for the role he's played in bringing people together. I imagine if you were sitting in the public benches half an hour ago, you might have thought this wasn't a particularly conciliatory process, but it is the basis of making legislation that we, we debate issues, sometimes very um, 
heatedly. Um, but I, I think we've come up with, with a good piece of legislation. Of course, the proof of the pudding will be, as I think my colleague Colin Smith said, perhaps in years to come. Um, and it has been the consensual approach there, and many have talked about manifesto commitments. My own party, the Scottish Green Party, had also had this as a manifesto commitment. And uh, as has been said on a number of occasions, the comparator with the Highlands and Islands, I don't think always is a direct one. Um, I, I, I think there's much to be, be learned, and that's good and bad from the experience there. Um, the, the Highlands was shaped and transformed post-Second World War by the, the hydro schemes, the Secretary of State for Scotland, Tom Johnson, introducing them. Subsequently, Highlands and Islands Development Board. And, you know, we, we, as humans, we can be very cynical. We tend to uh, reflect on some of the negatives rather than the positives. But uh, an awful lot of positives came from that and uh, the, the new iteration of that Highlands and Islands enterprise, albeit with a slightly changed focus. Um, it's always about partnership, and we've discussed throughout this the, the role that um, the agency can play in galvanising support, bringing people together to, to the common objective. And that objective is to make things, the lives for people in the south of Scotland, better. And I have to say, you know, as, as someone who um, is very enthusiastic at the role that state can play, I hope people will maybe reflect at the benefit that the, the enthusiasm for this has and not be so scared of state involvement in things. I think uh, partnership with communities is very important. Um, and uh, the, the, the situation that um, about funding was, was, was mentioned and, and, and I think um, it wasn't uh, ever going to be like with, like with the, the Highlands. I didn't want, and I was at Keene as a Highlands and Islands member, to stress this isn't, shouldn't be a competition about North versus South. This should be about making things better for the South. And one of the, the gauges of that will be, as others have touched on, will not just be um, the retention of the existing population and there's no doubt that education facilities um, and skills and the availability of skills leading to a, a better um, and an increase in, in, in wages will um, help that um, but also growing the population and uh, um, one of the um, factors that I was pleased to have played a part in having mentioned the face of bill it wasn't that it had been forgotten about but again the will to have it expressly expressed the, the views that we heard from Dr Callum McLeod of Community Land Scotland um, um, and uh, part of the remit of the new agency should be to establish a community assets team that's something else that in the years to come people will appreciate that um, has brought people together. So the engagement started long before we were um, involved in this bill. There was, as has been said, this has had a long genesis. I think it's important to, to congratulate Professor Griggs and the South of Scotland Economic Partnership. Um, I think co-location is going to be crucial as the agency moves forward because there's no doubt if you can see the whites of eyes of people at improves the relationship um, and an important point that my colleague uh, Colin Smith uh, made um, that is something that we can learn from the Highlands very easy uh, to have a three-figure number of jobs created in an urban area in laud that actually having a small number of jobs in a rural area that means that the rural school can be retained and everything that goes with it is something that's important so I look forward to the success of the agency thank you Mike Rumbles four minutes please <clears throat> now, the Liberal Democrats fully support the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. Now, this is the kind of legislation which can really benefit the people of the South of Scotland. It's about supporting the environment, and it's at the same time supporting inclusive and sustainable economic growth. It's about increasing the number of residents who are of working age, enhancing skills and capacities relevant to employment, encouraging business startups and entrepreneurship, promoting improved transport services, for instance, but most importantly, it's about supporting communities to help them meet their needs, the needs that they identify. And that's the most important part of this bill, I think. I'm particularly pleased at the way in which not only did the members of the committee work well together, although exchanging some of the debates on some of the amendments today, you might not think so, but we did. We worked well together to improve this bill. And as a result, with engaging people themselves uh, in the south of Scotland. But I particularly thought the visits the committee made with a formal committee meeting in uh, Dumfries and our meeting in Gala Shields was excellent. But I want to put on record that Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary, has clearly and demonstrably worked extremely hard to ensure that we got this bill right. Um, he was willing to listen to the evidence he responded extremely well to the committee's stage one report. I have to say, 
That's not always been my experience of ministers' responses to stage one reports. And came forward with very constructive amendments at stage two. And again, here today, he did the same for the stage three debate. And if I may say so, his work with MSPs of all parties, I don't think I'm betraying any confidences, between each stage of this process was to be welcomed. I re reiterate, presiding officer, that this bill should enable us to achieve real change in the south of Scotland. But it is only a start. And having worked so long on this in committee, I have mixed feelings about it. I think that with this bill, we've got it right. So why do I have mixed feelings about this bill? It's because I'm an MSP from the Northeast. Uh, and I'd really like to see a similar bill for my constituents. And his deputy sitting beside him is an MSP from the Northeast. And I hope they're having this conversation right now. And I hope they turn their heads towards the Northeast in the future. That would be a really first class idea. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Maureen Watt. Does the member not realise, and he would if he came to some of the events in the North East, that the North East uh, NHS and uh, the, the ent North Grampian Enterprise are very fortunate to have one Opportunity North East also working on enterprise in the North East and almost doubling the funding? Mike Rumbles. Yes, in the same way as that we already had organisations in the south of Scotland for this purpose, and I thought the member who is a member of the committee would realise that. I'm talking about what we've done for the South of Scotland, we could do for the North East. So after that very positive intervention, I'm pleased to um, resume by saying that um, it is a good bill. And I just want to finish by saying, I know time is short, that the, the Cabinet Secretary deserves recognition for the work he has done to deliver it. Thank you. Uh, can I thank all those for brevity in their speeches? It's allowed us to make up time. And uh, we now move to the open debate, in which there is one speaker, and that's Emma Harper. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. I am extremely pleased to speak in favour of the South Scotland Enterprise Agency Bill. This bill, which will have, I've engaged in uh, at stage one and throughout, it will undoubtedly benefit the South of Scotland. It will allow communities, businesses, including our small and micro businesses and people across the South to be supported and to develop and support and continue empowerment to deliver transform, transformational economic and cultural change, which will be key to the region's success. I've had the privilege of working with those involved in the interim South Scotland Economic Partnership, SOSEP, and have been able to work closely and collaboratively with many, including Professor Russell Griggs, Rob Dixon, Dame Barbara Kelly, Amanda Bergauer, Lorna Young and Eilat Roan, and others, all of whom I engage with regularly to discuss the issues across South Scotland. Indeed, from the outset, I want to thank all involved for their work, which has allowed for a fresh approach to promote sustainable economic growth in the South West and across the rest of the South of Scotland. I also thank all who have provided briefings for the debate today and the clerks who have, as always, worked extremely competently to get us to this stage. Presiding officer, on the 14th of January, I attended the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee's informal workshop and formal committee meeting at Easterbrook Hall in Dumfries. And the meeting, which was attended by over 120 people from a range of community groups, local authorities and businesses from across the southwest of Scotland, it provided an opportunity for local voices to feed into the committee's work and ultimately the report. And to say what they felt had to be done to benefit the unique nature of the challenges seen across the southwest of Scotland, as well as to inform the committee members. The stakeholder engagement meetings have been key in informing the approach and content of the bill. And I thank the Scottish Government and REC Committee for their level of engagement they have had with the people that the bill will directly impact. Presiding officer, it is vitally important for the new South Scotland Enterprise Agency to take a fresh, tailored approach to supporting the economy of the South of Scotland. South Scotland, particularly in the South West, including Dumfries and Galloway, has a different and distinct rural economy with wide ranging and significant opportunities, as well as its fair share of challenges such as an aging population, need for private sector investment, and also we require a good standard of transport infrastructure and our roads have been mentioned already and I agree with Mr Carson, we need to focus on our infrastructure, our roads and rail, the A75, 76 and 77. The Borders has a train line which connects its communities to Edinburgh and the Central Belt. 
whereas people in Galloway and areas between Dumfries and Stranraer do not have the ease of connectivity to the centre, central belt and the wider regions. I am therefore pleased that this bill is intentionally high level and enabling. It aims to provide the South Scotland Enterprise SOCI agency with the powers necessary for it to achieve its strategic aims, flexibility and res be responsive. I would, however, make a plea to those involved in the new chair once announced to ensure that the agency is not border centric and ensures that Dumfries and Galloway and the South West is equally considered. The aim will also be aided by the location of the agency, which will have an HQ hub, but not operate just in one area, but have areas throughout the South, which is crucial due to the region's rural geography. And John Finney, Finney has already mentioned co-location being important. I will be making representations for any hub to be located centrally, perhaps in Dumfries itself. I am pleased that the bill also makes clear the Scottish Government's commitment to ensuring the new agency receives a fair budget. The Government has committed to ensuring that the agency is funded on a pre capita equivalent basis to the Highlands and Islands enterprise. In conclusion, I would like again to put on record my support for the creation of this much needed agency in the south of Scotland. It has been a long time coming and I look forward to continuing to work with all to ensure that it delivers for my constituents, particularly across the south west and the rest of south Scotland, to ensure that they are collaborative, collaborated with and not forgotten. So I encourage all members to support this bill this evening. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches and I call Claudia Beamish for four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the introduction of this bill, as many members have said, and I recognise the Cabinet Secretary's work on this, and I would particularly like to thank my fellow South Scotland uh, colleague and friend Colin Smith and other South Scotland MSPs, uh, in addition to the committee, for the um, input and scrutiny they provided into the bill. As Scottish Labour spokesperson on land reform, I particularly welcome the amendments from Gail Ross and John Finney at stage two, which will empower communities to give the new uh, and give the new enterprise agency a similar social remit and land ownership remit uh, to Highlands and Islands Enterprise, which has been so successful in supporting and enable commu enabling communities uh, for a sustainable economic future in their own hands. These amendments to the bill are so important to empower communities to take ownership of local and building assets. As was discussed at stage two of the bill, this has been a success of high, and I'm encouraged that the new South, Scotland, South of Scotland agency will have a similar social remit. I strongly support the bill, and I'm excited to see the positive effects the new agency will bring to the communities of South Scotland, and also in particularly in retaining young people in the region. However, I must strongly make the following point of continuing concern. Where this bill will deliver for people within the new agency boundaries, it highlights very starkly the lack of support, in my view, for those communities it will not reach. Recent assurances from Scottish Enterprise have not gone far enough. Some of my constituents in areas like Clydesdale and South Ayrshire are concerned and disappointed by what they believe to be a failure of the Scottish Government to provide them with a similar opportunity. Therefore, I ask the Cabinet Secretary what reassurance he can give to my constituents on the specific points he will take actions to support Clydesdale. This is part of the South Scotland region I represent and looks far more to the south than to Glasgow. I really worry about the supposed reassurance given by Scottish Enterprise in a letter to me recently, in which they state, I quote, a series of regional economic partnerships have been formed across much of Scotland and Clydesdale is covered by the Glasgow uh, city region. I have seen no evidence of a focus on the sustainable development of Clydesdale within the city region deal. What can the Cabinet Secretary do to help address these concerns quickly? They're surely well beyond the operational. In relation to the new agency though, to be positive, Transport Scotland has written to me highlighting that the second strategic transport projects review will, I quote, take account of the priorities emerging from the new national transport strategy and support the government policies, including those on climate change and tackling inequality. I hope that this will also include rurality. I'm delighted that the bill was amended at stage two to include environmental policies, recognizing the need to shift um, and give support to the shift to the net zero economy, as amended by Colin Smith. It was necessary that the bill reflected this in the context of the current climate emergency. 
I'm disappointed, though, that the Cabinet Secretary did not recognise the significance of my amendment to put support for cooperation for environmental reasons on the face of the bill in this environment and climate emergency. However, I hope that he will ensure that these issues are taken forward um, in, in regulation. I welcome the South Scotland Enterprise Bill and, and I look forward to its passing and to working with all those involved for sustainable development across the region. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Rachel Hamilton for four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, may I refer, refer members to my register of interests? Uh, Today, we will be voting on these benches to allow the bill to pass the final stage and let the agency become a reality. The South of Scotland Enterprise Agency holds the key to unlocking significant potential right across our region, and I look forward to the renewed economic drive that it will hopefully deliver. The agency should be an enabler and not a disa disabler. It must be dynamic and suit the needs of the South of Scotland. We've heard many uh, here today say that it might be based on the model of Highlands and Islands Enterprise, um, but we do recognise that our area is distinctive and different to the Highlands, and that bespoke approach must shine through, uh, shaped by those who have a passion for the south of Scotland. It is slightly unfortunate on these benches that Colin Smith's amendment Two, which included support for rural businesses, was not supported because that is crucial to our large rural region. Removing barriers is key to achieving accessible funding. And I want to see an agency which makes obtain, obtaining support a lot simpler with a focus on that rurality. As Shadow's Cabinet Secretary for Culture, I was pleased to see and support Joan McAlpine's amendment, which includes cultural assets. Uh, we need to attract more tourists to the south of Scotland because we have such unique culture, history and heritage. Initiatives like the Sea South Scotland campaign must be built upon and expanded. On these benches, we were also disappointed that the affordable housing wasn't part of the, uh, on the face of the bill because it is a crucial part of the economy in the south of Scotland and a lack of affordable housing could, have been considered, could be considered a barrier to retaining young people and in turn economic growth. And a key aim of SOCIA is to deliver construction skills. Therefore, a focus on affordable housing could have played a key role. And whilst I recognise the South of Scotland uh, agency will not so solve all of the issues, it will go some way to improve support for startups and will encourage a supportive business atmos atmosphere. For years, we've seen the low wage, low hours jobs, gender pay gap, and a skills shortage. And these four issues are not unique to the borders, but are definitely exacerbated because of the rurality and indeed the poor connectivity, both, both physically and digitally. As I have alert, alluded to, skills development is essential for retaining young people and upskilling working age people, and indeed within, within the ageing um, demographic that we see in the south of Scotland. We must have an agency that uh, where colleges work in partnership whilst encouraging a knowledge ex exchange. And that is why we supported Maureen Watt's uh, amendment, uh, bringing in organisations as well as just persons. As well as businesses, we also need to see a greater range of society participating in the overall aims of the new agency and participating in economic growth. Further education institutions must be supported through the new agency to encourage rural skills. The borders is as rural as Dumfries and Galloway. Working in partnerships is absolutely key. But in doing this, we must make it easy for people to access education by reducing those transportation difficulties. And making learning an out-of-class experience relies on good digital infrastructure. And so far, we are lagging behind with that. The impact of these actions could be significant. It would drive greater innovation in the economy, improve competitiveness in the workforce and productivity in business. And this ultimately will lead to better sustainability when it comes to local businesses too. Lastly, presiding officer, the gender pay gap is a massive issue, which I believe deserves the greatest attention. If we are to retain young people, especially young women in the borders and Dumfries and Galloway, we need to ensure that that gap closes. And it would be fantastic if the new agency could support more women into the workforce and provide support to start up in new businesses. We will support the bill tonight and I look forward to it being delivered. I call on Fergus Ewing um, to wind up the debate. Five minutes, Cabinet Secretary, to take us to just before decision time. 
Uh, presiding officer, this bill allows for an enterprise agency to be made of the south of Scotland by the south of Scotland for the south of Scotland. And I want to thank all of those people in the south of Scotland, especially those who contributed to the proceedings, the consultation, for their positive engagement with the bill process. Their perspectives have helped shape this legislation and will continue to shape the priorities of what will be their enterprise agency. Uh, and I would like to add my praise to the members of the South of Scotland Economic Partnership over the past 18 months. Their work has really been unstinting in the local engagement, the meetings they've attended throughout the whole area. I actually haven't seen anything like it and I've been around for quite a long time. Uh, and I think Emma Harper mentioned some of the members of the partnership, uh, and I really would pay tribute to them, and in particular to their chair, Russell Griggs, Professor Russell Griggs, for energy and commitment, which I think has really helped to, uh, uh, to, to give an, an element of excitement about the new opportunities that lie ahead. The foundation work has paved the way for the new enterprise agency to flourish. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the uh, committee clerks for their work. As has been alluded to, uh, I, I think by, by Finlay, the, the committee met around the region. It didn't just stay in Edinburgh and take evidence in Edinburgh. It got out of here and into the south of Scotland to meet and hear and listen to people there. And that the committee is to be commended for that. It involves an awful lot of effort and hard work. Um, I would also like to express my profound personal thanks to the Scottish Government Bill team. And I was very pleased to hear other members, including Colin Smith, do so, because we have worked together, and I think members uh, across the chamber have learned to see just how significant uh, uh, and helpful the contribution of government officials in the Bill team has been for their sterling work in drafting and shaping the bill and their willingness to find solutions, but also, as Mr. Rumbles pointed out, to respond positively to the views of members on the REC committee from the south of Scotland. This has been a collegiate effort, and I'm pleased that Parliament has performed that role, presiding officer. This bill fulfills a programme for government commitment to create a new enterprise agency for the south of Scotland. And it was a key recommendation arising from the Enterprise and Skills Review. And I'd pay tribute to Keith Brown for his work there on end and for shaping the bill content and establishing the partnership. Our collective efforts, including those of MSPs across the chamber, will ensure that South of Scotland Enterprise takes the different and fresh approach people ask for. Rachel Hamilton quite rightly mentioned the important work they do in respect of women. She is absolutely right. And I expect the Women in Agriculture Development, for example, to be an early opportunity to build on that work. Um, this will be a keystone organisation looking to, to, to bring economic and social and our event, environmental development to create jobs and prosperity for everyone who works there. Although we've had differences this afternoon, I want to give my absolute assurance that the differences we've discussed have been about process, not about substance. And in response, I think, to questions raised by Finlay Carson and Claudia Beamish and Colin Smith, yes, of course, this agency will take a very close interest to further all the matters that have been referred to. Yes, of course, it will seek to advance the areas of the uh, rural business. Yes, of course, it will take a deep, close and profound interest in pursuing uh, the best environmental practice. And I specifically wanted to provide direct and positive responses to all members, you know that I am, in fact, Mr. Positive. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you. Uh, and, <laughs> and could I say that, that uh, it's been quite remarkable that consensus has broken out in this chamber, and I'm really quite touched by all the nice things that people have said, particularly Mr. Rumbles. Uh, I never said this before. I never said this before. And as has been pointed out by Mr. Day, I may never say it again, but all I can say is, oh shucks, presiding officer. Um, but in bringing my remarks to a close, could I say that we are creating a foundation today for a new chapter in the life of Scotland and in the south of Scotland uh, in particular. 
Uh, uh, and uh, just as Willie Ross did when he strove to establish a development board for the Highlands and Islands, when he said the Highlander is the man in Scotland's conscience, for too long the people of the south of Scotland have perceived themselves to be forgotten and neglected. We now have a chance to bring that to an end. And in the words uh, of the region's greatest, one of the region's greatest living sons, Calvin Harris, I say to the people of... <laughs> Yes, I, I know him well. I know of him. I say to the people of Dumfries and Galloway, it's not about what you've done. It's all about where you're going. Right now is where you shine. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 17533 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move this motion? Uh, yeah, if I can keep a straight face. Uh, move, presiding officer. <laughs> Thank you very much, Minister. And no one wishes to speak on the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 17533 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of six Parliamentary Bureau motions. Could I ask Graeme Day to move 17534, 17536, 17537 and 17538 on approval of an SSI, 17535 on a draft notice and 17539 on the designation of a lead committee? Moved, President Officer. Thank you very much. And we turn now to decision time. The first question is that motion 17517 in the name of Fergus Ewing on the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill be agreed. And because this is the bill, members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17517 in the name of Fergus Ewing is yes, 113. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions. The motion is agreed and the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill is passed. <laughs> now, if no one objects, I propose to put a single question on the six parliamentary bureau motions. Is that okay? That's good. Uh, the question is that motions 17534 to 17539 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members' business in the name of Claire Adamson on Child Safety Week 2019. But we'll just take a few moments for the member and ministers to change seats. <laughs>